the different philosophers in the modern education and their historical contribution to education. Friedrich Froebel He was a German educator of the 19th century who developed an idealist philosophy of early childhood education. He established kindergarten and education for four- and five-year-old children. Kindergarten is now a part of education worldwide. His most important contribution to educational theory was his belief in self-activity and play as essential factors in child education. The teacher's role was not to drill or indoctrinate the children, but rather to encourage their self-expression through play, both individually and in group activities. Next is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau is known as the father of early childhood education. As a result of his educational viewpoint, Early childhood education emerged as a child-centered entity rich in unlimited sensory-driven, practical experiences, active participation in drawing, measuring, speaking, and singing also emerged as a result of Rousseau's educational viewpoint. Today, many elements of Rousseau's educational principles remain as a dominant force in early childhood education. Rousseau's theory of education emphasized the importance of expression to produce a well-balanced, free-thinking child. He believed that if children are allowed to develop naturally without constraints imposed on them by society, they will develop towards their fullest potential, both educationally and morally. This natural development should be child-centered and focus on the needs and experiences of the child at each stage of development. Next is Johann Herbert. He was a German philosopher and educator who led the renewed 19th century interest in realism and is considered among the founders of modern scientific pedagogy. His theory of education, known as Herbartianism, was set out principally in two works, the Pestalozzi's Ideanis, ABC Der Anschung, and the Algemeine Pedagogik, which advocated five formal steps in teaching. First is the preparation. Second is presentation, followed by the association, generalization, and application. Preparation It is a process of relating new material to be learned to relevant past ideas of memories in order to give the pupil a vital interest in the topic under consideration. Preparation is concerned with the task of preparing the students for receiving new knowledge. In preparation, nothing new is taught to students. Relevant to the topic in hand, the teacher should make himself sure of what the pupils already know. By putting a few questions based on the pupils' previous knowledge, in general, with the help of this step, the teacher can check the student's entering behavior before he start teaching the lesson. Next is presentation. Presenting new material by means of concrete objects or actual experience. Presentation is the key step and only through which the actual process of teaching is going to take place. Here, the aims of the lesson should be stated clearly and the heading should be written on the blackboard. We have to provide situation for both the teacher and the students to participate in the process of teaching and learning. Our ultimate aim of the presentation is to make the concepts understandable to the students. Therefore, simple language is used. Appropriate and specific examples and illustration of the concepts will make the understanding better. The interest of the students on the subject matter should be maintained continuously by the way of asking questions from time to time in this stage. 
The teacher should carefully and skillfully arrange his material so that his pupil may clearly and readily grasp it. The teacher should make proper use of questions, charts, graphs, pictures, models, and other illustrative for demonstration and explanation. At the end of each section, a few questions concerning that section only should be asked to whether the pupils are now ready for the acquisition of new knowledge. The third step in teaching is the association. Through assimilation of the new idea, through comparison with former ideas, and consideration of their similarities and differences in order to implant the new idea in the mind. Comparison or association is more important should be given in this stage to compare the facts observed by the students with another concept by way of giving examples. By making use of this comparison, the students can derive definition or theories. The students are encouraged to give new suitable examples for the concept instead of the examples given in the book to make them think in an innovative manner. Fourth is generalization, a procedure specially important to the instruction of adolescents and designed to develop the mind beyond the level of perception and the concrete. Generalization is concerned with arriving at some general ideas or drawing out the necessary conclusions by the students on the basis of the different comparisons, contracts, and associated observed in the learning material present by the teacher. As far as possible, the task of formulation should be left to students. The teacher at this stage should try to remain in the background for providing only necessary guidance and correction. Lastly is application. Using acquired knowledge not in purely utilitarian way but so that every learned idea becomes a part of the functional mind and an aid to a clear vital interpretation of life. This step is presumed possible only if the student immediately applies the new idea, making it his own. In this stage, the teacher makes the students to use the understood knowledge in an familiar situation. Unless the knowledge of science is applied in new situations or in our day-to-day -day life, the study of science will become meaningless. This application of scientific principles will threaten learning and will make the learning permanent. Next is Pedro Povida. He was a Spanish priest, humanitarian, educator, and martyr. He was the founder of the Teresian Association. His humanitarian educational activity lasted for over 30 years until his execution by persecutors of Christians' faith in 1936. Povida was canonized in 2003. His feast day is 28th of July. In 1911, Pedro founded the St. Teresa of Avila Academy in Oviedo for those ladies studying to become teachers. He named it after St. Teresa of Avila, a woman of learning a doctor of the church, and a teacher of prayer. St. Pedro Pobida, grasping the importance of the role of education in society, undertook an important humanitarian and educational task among the marginalized and the needy. He was a teacher of the Christian life and of the relationship between faith and knowledge. Convinced that Christians must bring essential values and commitment to building a world that is more just and mutually supportive. His life ended with the crown of martyrdom. Next is John Henry Newman. He was an English theologian, scholar, and poet. First an Anglican priest and later a Catholic priest and cardinal, who was an important and controversial figure in the religious history of England in the 19th century. He was known nationally by the mid of 1830s and was canonized as a saint in the Catholic Church in 2019.
In his discourses on the scope and nature of universities' education, Newman argued that universities should include a liberal education for all their students. While he relates liberal education to universities, it can apply also to other educational levels, colleges, institutes, and to self-education. Newman argued against the view that it is sufficient for university education to serve society's economic needs and provide for the professions, and that anything further is useless. He regarded liberal education as a good thing, like physical health. This makes it useful in a general sense without having to be for a specific purpose. Its general usefulness enables teachers to avoid being absorbed and narrowed by their specialism and instead develop a broad view of how it relates to other specialism and to society. According to John Henry Newman, liberal education empowers citizens to be informed, questioning and open to different points of view. It also helps students to take up different types of jobs and perform them with more ease and versatility than otherwise. And it is especially useful as preparation for dealing with a contested social and political world, where us knowledge education on its own can result in having no opinion or only unsupported assertions. Next is John Dewey. He was an American philosopher, psychologist, and educational reformer whose ideas have been influential in education and social reform. He was one of the most prominent American scholars in the first half of the 20th century. John Dewey was the most significant educational thinker of his era. Many would argue of the 20th century as a philosopher and social reformer and education. He changed fundamental approaches to teaching and learning. His ideas about education sprang from a philosophy of pragmatism and were central to the progressive movement in schooling. In light of his importance, it is ironic that many of his theories have been relatively poorly understood and hazardly applied over the past hundred years. Dewey's concept of education put a premium on meaningful activity in learning and participation in classroom democracy. Unlike earlier models of teaching, which relied on authoritarianism and note learning, Progressive education asserted that students must be invested in what they were learning. Dewey argued that curriculum should be relevant to students' lives. He saw learning by doing and development of practical life skills as crucial to children's education. Some critics assume that, under Dewey's system, students would fail to acquire basic academic skills and knowledge. Others believe that classroom order and the teacher's authority would disappear. To Dewey, the central ethical imperative in education was democracy. Every school, as he wrote in the school and society, must become an embryonic community life, active with types of occupations that reflect the life of the larger society and permitted throughout with the spirit of art, history and science when the school introduces and trains each child of society into membership within such a little community saturating him with the spirit of service and providing him with the instruments of effective self-direction we shall have the deepest and best guarantee of a larger society which is worthy lovely and harmonious Next is Maria Montessori. She was an Italian physician and educator best known for the philosophy of education that bears her name and her writing on scientific pedagogy. At an early age, Montessori enrolled in classes at an all-boys technical schools with hopes of becoming an engineer. She soon had the chance of heart and began medical school. 
where she graduated with honors in 1896. Her educational method is in use today in many public and private schools globally. Physician Maria Montessori is recognized as one of the pioneers in the development of early childhood education. She is also created with promoting a substantial number of important educational reforms that have worked their way over the course of the 20th century into the mainstream of education. Montessori influenced by P.J., Freud, and Erickson and many educators. She is relevant to educational beliefs today because she introduced a different way of thinking on how children learn best. She is best remembered for her contributions including program instruction, open classroom, concrete learning materials, individualized education, manipulative learning materials, and teaching toys. Montessori training and schools are prevalent in the United States today, as well as other countries. The small furniture, children learning by doing, higher order thinking skills being encouraged by teachers, individualized education, especially in special education, and manipulatives can be seen in schools. Her research has been proved consistent with the research of child development conducted in the last 35 years. Traditional schools pay little attention to children as individuals and that children must adopt and learn traditional standards. Next is Herbert Spencer. He was a British positive philosopher, sociologist, and educational reformer. He was well known as social dwarnism, father and proposed a theory of applying evolutionary theory to sociology, especially education, and class struggle. President of Harvard University said Spencer was a true pioneer of education. Herbert Spencer defined the purpose and task of education was to teach everyone how to live completely. He arranged the activities of people into five categories to determine the teaching content. First is the directly minister to self-preservation activities required understanding of anatomy, physiology, and hygiene. Second is the indirectly minister to self-preservation activities to secure the necessaries of life lead not only to master the basic skills of reading, writing, and computing, but also to grasp the logic of arithmetic, geometry, mechanism, physics, chemistry, astronomy, geology, biology, sociology, and foreign language knowledge. Third is the rearing activities required the study of physiology, psychology, and pedagogy in order to correctly implement the physical, intellectual, and moral education of children. Fourth is the social obligation activities bring that people are necessary to study history. Fifth is the leisure activities to meet the needs of interests and feelings. Spencer's claim on the content of education contains a wide range of disciplines. In teaching methods, Spencer advocated the automatic learning based on students and emphasized the role of interest in the process of teaching. In the aspect of moral education, Spencer put forward that individual self-preservation is the most important moral principle and coined the moral evolution formula. In respect of discipline, he opposed punishment and advocated the principle of natural consequence. Spencer's core idea of education mainly includes the following aspect. First is to advocate scientific education and object classical education. Second is to promote independent education and oppose indoctrination education. And lastly, the third is to encourage education with happiness and interest and combat education ignoring the rule of students' physical and mental development. Lastly is Paulo Freire. He was a Brazilian educator whose ideas on the role of education for the poor.
proved to be tremendously influential. After training as a lawyer, he decided to become a secondary school teacher, rising to become director of the Department of Education and Culture in the Brazilian state of Pernambuco. He later worked in various Brazilian universities, developing adult literacy program. After a military coup in Brazil in 1964, he lived and worked in Chile for five years. Then, with the World Council of Churches in Geneva, not turning to Brazil until 1980 during his time of exile. He developed his ideas further and published a number of books, the most renowned of which was Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Friar saw the moral potential in a transformative education, the potential to liberate. A careful analysis of the teacher-student relationship at any level, inside or outside the school, reveals it fundamentally in narrative character. The relationship involves a narrating subject, which is the teacher, and patients listening objects, which is the students. Narration with the teacher as narrator leads the students to memorize mechanically the narrated content. Worse, still it turns them into containers, into receptacles to be filled by the teachers. The more completely he fills the receptacles, the better a teacher he is. The more meekly the receptacles permit themselves to be filled, the better students they are. Education becomes an act of depositing in which the students are the depositaries and the teacher is the depositor. Instead of communicating, the teacher issue communicates and make deposits which the students patiently receive, memorize, and repeat. This is the banking concept of education in which the scope of action allowed to the students only as far as receiving, feeling, and storing the deposits. They do, it is true, have the opportunity to become collectors of catalogers of the things they store. But, in the last analysis, it is people themselves who are filled away through the lack of creativity, transformation, and knowledge in this at best misguided system. For apart from inquiry, apart from the praxis or the people cannot be truly human, knowledge emerge only through invention and reinvention, through the restless, impatient, continuing, hopeful inquiry men pursue in the world, with the world and with each other.